AM radio, an op-ed column, and Fox News is not enough. I want a center-right nation to fight for its soul, and its soul is represented in the arts. Its soul is represented in, in a world in which media is everything. AM radio is the lowest form of communication. It's tinny. It's not robust. It's not avatar. I want avatar. I want the right to enter the world of media to the extent and invest in media the way that the left does. The fake media is trying to silence us, but we will not let them because the people know the truth. The fake media tried to stop us from going to the White House, but I'm president and they're not. You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast, a Breitbart.com podcast. The podcast starts now. Here's Kurt with today's headlines. Hey guys, welcome to another edition of the Kurt Schilling Podcast. And this is the uh, slam dunk end of the week. Couldn't have asked for a better show kind of thing going today. I got blessed to have Candace Owens who will join me first, the communications director for Turning Point USA. And you do not want to miss this fascinating interview with this lovely, wonderful, intelligent, brilliant woman. And then following Candace will be the former White House press secretary, Sean Spicer. His new book, The Briefing, Politics, the Press, and the President, is available anywhere American-loving books are sold, including Amazon.com. And you're not going to want to miss that one as well as we kind of get behind the scenes and talk about what it's like to live the life of a press secretary. We're going to kick out this morning, though, with uh, news that I would I, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a little proud to say that maybe kind of broke here. Jim Jordan was on Fox and Friends and he opens up about something he spoke about, I think, for the first time openly on our show, which was his bid for the uh, Speaker of the House. Listen up. You've just announced you sent a letter saying that you want to run for Speaker of the House. Yes. How would you uh, come to this decision? Well, think about it this way. In the, in the last year and a half, under President Trump, regulations are down, taxes are down, the economy is up, we're going to get great numbers today. Unemployment's at its lowest in 20 years. Gorsuch is on the court. Kavanaugh is on deck. We're out of the crazy Iran deal. The embassy's in Jerusalem, and the hostages have come back from North Korea. An amazing year and, and a half. And remains are coming back today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I'm forgetting some other good things. So that's an ama- by anyone's definition, that's an amazing year and a half. But think about Congress. What has Congress done? We've certainly helped with the taxes, but all those other things that we told the American people we would accomplish. Repeal and we replace. Have a, repeal Obamacare, reform welfare, build b- the border security wall, and, and fix our immigration system and control spending. We haven't done that. So I think this is real simple. I, I, I always say this. We make the job of being a member of Congress way too difficult. It's really basic. What did you tell the voters you were going to do? Mm-hmm. Let's do that. And we haven't done enough of that. We need to do more of that and help President Trump make America great again and do the things that we said. Well, let's talk about some things in the news this past week. Uh, Eleven members of the House Freedom Caucus uh, signed articles of impeachment. Yep. Uh, went into the House uh, yesterday. They, they pretty much decided, you know what, we're not going to go forward with that. I understand, apparently, behind the scenes, the Department of Justice, when they got that squeeze, suddenly said, you know what, we are going to produce more documents, which is what you wanted to do in the first place. Exactly. But why did you uh, you all take that tack? We, we ha- all we've done is file it, so uh, it's still there. It, okay. it's, it's, to the, it's sent to the Judiciary Committee. It can be brought up at any time. Uh, the only way we've gotten documents and information that we're entitled to get, so the American people can get, get, can get answers, is when we put the pressure on them. It's always still so It's always worked. Of course it worked. I mean, we, we have caught Rod. We, we sent letters back in November for information they didn't comply with. Two subpoenas they haven't complied with. We've caught the Justice Department trying to hide information from us. Namely, when they redacted the portion of the text message where it showed Peter Strzok was friends with one of the FISA court judges, mm-hmm. who happened to be the same federal judge who heard Mike Flynn's case. And we know Rod Rosen, Fox News reported this, uh, Catherine Herridge and, and Greg Jarrett, we know Rod Rosenstein threatened staff members on the House Intelligence Committee when they were trying to do their job to get answers. So that's the history. We have to continue to push or we're not going to get the information. That is, in a nutshell, uh, God, and I'm going to tweet this out later today, but the liberals better find God very soon because if Jim Jordan gets Speaker of the House and you have a Congress and a Senate enforcing and, and, and pushing the mandates that the, they promised the American people, along with the president who's keeping his campaign promises, then the entire liberal population will have to move to the left coast of California because this country will no longer be welcoming socialist and fascist and anti-capitalism, anti-law enforcement idiots.
And then we go right from, you know, relevant, incredible, you know, important speaker of the house to where the left is. And their focus apparently is on a phone call between President Trump and his lawyer who committed a disbarable act, I believe, in, in uh, recording a conversation. It has nothing to do with the presidency or running the White House. But listen, this is Anderson Cooper with this riveting uh, take on Trump's quote unquote silence. It's been nearly 48 hours since the secret recording made by Michael Cohen of Donald Trump was first played on CNN. Nearly 48 hours since it became clear that the president and his campaign lied about his knowledge of a deal to buy the silence of a former Playboy model who alleges a 10 month long affair with Mr. Trump. Nearly 48 hours and no one, no one at the White House and certainly not the president himself has owned up to the lie. The silence is deafening. CNN has new reporting tonight that the president is feeling the heat. One official telling us, and I'm quoting here, it's getting closer and closer to his inner circle. How do you think he feels? Well, today, it got a heck of a lot closer. According to the Wall Street Journal, Alan uh, Weisselberg, the longtime chief financial officer for the Trump Organization, was subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury in connection with the Michael Cohen investigation. Now, you may recognize Mr. Weisselberg. He was, uh, for a time, a judge on The Apprentice. The Wall Street Journal broke the story, a former Trump Organization employee telling CNN that Weisselberg knows every deal that the president has been involved with, quote, every sale, anything and everything that's been done, including, it seems, the deal that candidate Trump and Michael Cohen talked about in September of 2016 and that Team Trump has lied about from the moment this story first came to light. The deal was to buy the rights of Karen McDougal's story. She's the Playboy model who was alleging a 10-month-long affair with Mr. Trump. The rights had just been purchased the month before by David Pecker, who runs the parent company, the National Enquirer. They purchased the rights and never ran the story, perhaps because David Pecker is friends with Donald Trump. Let me just concede every point he just made, whether it's true or not. The president had an affair with the Playboy Centerfold and was going to buy the story from the National Enquirer. He may have lied about it. A man lying about a potential affair uh, to keep it under wraps. My God, the inhumanity. I, I don't like it. Uh, I think it speaks ill of some potential character issues. This is the same Anderson Cooper who told you for a decade that President Bill Clinton was an amazing human being when he was probably the most revoltingly scum of the earth person that ever walked next to his wife. None of this has anything to do with American policy or American success. He talks about the silence uh, of President Trump. President Trump's not silent. He's actually out talking about the things that actually matter to you and me, the American people. I want you to listen to this quick soundbite that came out just today. Moments ago, the numbers for America's economic growth or GDP were just released. And I am thrilled to announce that in the second quarter of this year, the United States economy grew at the amazing rate of 4.1 percent. We're on track to hit the highest annual average growth rate in over 13 years. And I will say this right now, and I'll say it strongly, as the trade deals come in one by one, we're going to go a lot higher than these numbers, and these are great numbers. During each of the two previous administrations, we averaged just over 1.8 percent GDP growth. By contrast, we are now on track to hit an average GDP annual growth of over 3%, and it could be substantially over 3%. Each point, by the way, means approximately $3 trillion and 10 million jobs. Think of that. Each point, you go up one point, it doesn't sound like much, it's a lot. What news piece right there, the Anderson Cooper comment uh, and, and, and soundbite or the Trump soundbite affects your life day to day more? And I say that for this reason. Be ready to hear another apocalyptic end of the world, somehow random story from the left starting today, because I agree. I, I believe the president. All economic indicators are pointing to uh, an average of over three percent, if not uh, and a, a quarterly of over four percent. Going into the midterms, can you think of a worse potential outcome for, for, for liberals and Democrats? That's the things we should be talking about. And then, you know, we'll get back to, to this whole uh, this. I don't I, I don't want to spend any time talking about it because I don't care about it. It doesn't impact my life uh, because my president's doing the job I, I asked him to do when he went to Washington. But listen to Rudy Giuliani talk about Michael Cohen and uh, and the credibility and character issues of a lawyer who who is not acting like a lawyer expected something like this from Cohen. He's been lying all week. I mean, or, or for two, he's been lying for years. I mean, uh, the 
the tapes that we have demonstrate any number of very serious lies by him back a year and a half ago, including his fooling people, hiding tape recordings, telling they weren't recorded, lying to their face, breaking faith with them, taping his client, which is a disbarable offense. I don't see how he has any credibility. I mean, this is basically if you had a trial, and there won't be a trial here, but if you had a trial, you'd say, well, which lie do you want to pick? You want to pick the first lie, the second lie, or maybe some new lie? There's nobody that I know that knows him that hasn't warned me that if he's back is up against the wall, he'll, he'll lie like crazy because he's lied all his life. All right. So the flip on it is this. To do that to me, to tell me a lie, that's the media, you know, what's mm-hmm. the recompense? To go to Bob Mueller and say he knew I was in the meeting, he heard his son, puts his son in the mix here also, the son told him he supported it. He says, according to our reporting, there were other people in the room. So this is something that Bob Mueller should be able to figure out, right? Well, the question isn't what happened in the room. The question is, what did the president know, as you said, and and Bernstein said, what did he know and when did he know it? So it would have to be people in the room with the president. Right. That can corroborate uh, Cohen, which there won't be because it didn't happen. And uh, then it becomes a credibility contest between two or three witnesses who say one thing and Cohen, who says another. Assuming they say different things. I'm pretty comfortable about that. I'm not, I haven't had a chance to go back and, and look at all of it, but I remember it pretty well. We're going to be continuing to get lectured on on this event that has nothing to do with anything our president has done to get the GDP to 4.1 percent. It's just it's tiring. I mean, it's it's but it's you got to keep playing it and understand making sure you understand that this is who the left is and this is what they're focused on. And I'm going to close out with a really uh, enjoyable message from the stock market. If you've watched over the last couple of months, I don't care how creative he is. I don't care that he's uh, worth billions. He's still just a kid at Harvard who happened to make a really cool piece of software. He doesn't have any special social insight or anything else. But uh, Mark Zuckerberg was the uh, was the target of the loss, biggest loss in stock market history. Listen to the, the summation. The sell-off was staggering and unprecedented. Facebook losing $119 billion in market value today alone. The worst single day ever for a U.S. company after this profit warning from CEO Mark Zuckerberg. We're investing so much in security that it will significantly impact our profitability. Zuckerberg himself lost $15 billion in the sell-off, coming after two years of scandals and investigations. It seems as though you turned a blind, blind eye to this, correct? Congressman, I disagree with that assessment. From Russian election meddling and disinformation to the 87 million users whose private information was compromised by Cambridge Analytica. Now, Facebook users are tightening their privacy settings and the number of daily users is dropping. So you could argue that there's a lot of rage out there against Facebook, but where do people go to express their rage? They go to Facebook and Instagram. Facebook insists it's making changes to address privacy and security, and it still dominates social media worldwide. From London to Berlin, the Vegas Strip to Tokyo, also owning Instagram, Messenger, and WhatsApp. Despite the stock sell-off today, it's only back to where it was in May. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Newsflash, Silicon Valley is a, uh, a bunch of clowns. This is a guy who, why would you expect him to understand customer security or, or, or the, the broad uh, uh, overall vision for faith? The guy, again, I, I'm not discrediting. He, he made his billions. He, he made his piece of software. That's awesome. But that's all it is. That, that doesn't make him some uh, 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 brilliant, uh, forward-thinking, edgy out of his own cut kind of a guy. It's just he's a guy who 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 made who's who's successful, who's making mistakes. And that's unfortunately he's making mistakes with things that affect you and I personally on a day to day basis. And that's where I think government and the American people are having the problem. But he he is one of the poster children for the left. So there is that. Uh, anyway, we're going to be back in just a minute. We're going to be joined by Candace Owens, and you're not going to want to miss this interview, followed by Sean Spicer. Back in just a minute. Sonny's Corner with Sonny Johnson. Everything in hip-hop is not bad. Kanye agreed with us, so let's love him today until he raps tomorrow and you turn your back. Because if you jump off when the fun of the moment is over, then you are in fact making Kanye the token he is accused of being. So please... Don't do that. Don't go there. Sunny's Corner with Sunny Johnson. Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m. East on Sirius XM Patriot 125. 
You're listening to the Kurt Schilling Podcast. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. Joining me now is the uh, first time I've ever had a chance to talk to this uh, beautiful young lady who is incredibly intelligent and forward thinking, and she is a breath of fresh air in a, a world gone crazy. She's the communications director for Turning Point USA. She is Candace Owens. Good morning, Candace. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing good. We were just talking about you're traveling, you're doing a lot of things, as, as thankfully you are, because I think that there are fewer and fewer places for conservatives like us to get our, our voice out there with the media doing the things it's doing these days. But I was talking about, I, I spent my whole life on an airplane, traveling and playing baseball and being in different cities. And I came to find out that in some small way, the United States was kind of like Europe in the sense that every state is its own thing. It's a, it's a different culture. It's a different group of people. But the one thing that I think ties the United States together for the most part is the love and affection we all have for the one country. That's correct. And, and that's, I think, why people are having so much trouble with this sort of rampant uh, anti-Americanism that's taking place on the left. And I, I know for me, traveling, every time I hit a new state, I realized how ignorant I was uh, when I had not traveled to that state. So it really makes you understand that it was an American revolution of sorts when America elected Donald Trump because we had forgotten that so much exists outside of the metropolitan cities. Given where you are and, and the platform that you have and, and you know, the fact that you're, I mean, you're a black conservative woman, which is the left's worst nightmare, and you're intelligent, you're well-spoken, you're educated like millions of other black women, but your voices are not being heard because, well, I mean, listen, I, I, I talk to people daily who wonder why there isn't more of you out there speaking. And most of it for me is because of the mainstream media's inability or, or uh, lack of desire to give a voice to people like, listen, I wasn't a Kanye West fan, but I can't get over the fact that how, how badly the left or minorities in this country are eating their own in the sense that every time somebody has an independent voice, if it's not left leaning, it gets destroyed. Right. And, and it's the greatest thing that can happen if you really think about it. It's this public display of hate and, and distaste for people that think differently is actually, I think, ultimately helping us. Um, it's showing that the, the people that preach uh, tolerance, we tolerance, you know, we love everybody, actually only like people that think exactly like them. Um, and they suppress anybody that has different ideas. I'm seeing so many more black conservatives pop up. If you're just looking on, on YouTube, I follow a lot of them. I'm in a group chat with many of them and speak every single day. And it, it, there's just this mass awakening happening within the minority community. And I just feel blessed to be a part of it. The great thing for me is when you look at things that are coming out, like the walk away movement, which unfortunately for the left is not a bunch of Russian bots. It's actual human beings because they're making videos and they're showing the world that, hey, you know what? We're actually being uh, woken up to the fact that the left is not who they say they are. They are actually who they say they hate. And, and I'm wondering, as you travel a country. So so back when President Trump won the election, I, I actually called the win, and I, but I missed it by four electoral votes. Um, because I think like you and like a lot of people, I had my eyes open. I was watching television. I was watching President Trump do a rally with 30,000 people in a line a mile down the road and Hillary Clinton in a room with 38 people. I mean, I, I can see the American people talking, but the media was not trying to let that voice get out. I'm wondering, as you travel the country right now, is that, are you seeing that same fervent attitude towards President Trump? As well? I mean, listen, the GDP is a 4.1 percent today. That's going to make the left go nuts again. Right. They're going to go absolutely nuts. And I think what the left and uh, media is trying to do is to create their own truth and create their own reality. And unfortunately, you can't do that. The truth is just the truth. So they try to show snippets of violence that they essentially started at Trump rallies um, that is not actually true. Um, when you're inside and you hear him speak, there's a calm and there's so much love. And like you spoke about, there's real patriotism. There's, there's this connection that you can't deny and this energy that you can't deny. When you walk out, you feel refreshed. And what's interesting, I've, I've now been able to, to see um, our president speak a couple of times, is there's so much light when he speaks. I mean, he, he genuinely is a happy, funny guy. And the media, unfortunately, is not going to be able to destroy him. So I'm really optimistic. And to see this happen for the first time within minority communities, to be a part of that movement, I can't explain to you what that feels like. It, it makes me emotional a lot of times just to understand how long we've been lied to, how long we've been duped, and to see that for uh, for the first time ever, we're coming around the corner and, and we're seeing the truth for what it is. 
I got to tell you, I wrote a blog post yesterday about, and one of the big arguments I've been in uh, is is this big shift that the Democrats want to claim happened back in the uh, 1960s. You know, the the big shift from Democrat to Republican, and today's Republicans were yesterday's Democrats. When that's all crap. It's 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 there's nothing rooted in fact in any of those comments and any of those arguments. And the pushback. It's funny because every time, much like I tell this story a lot. If you want to understand liberals and and conservatives, I went to a a show in Boston, and it was Bill Maher against uh, Ann Coulter. And I was the one of the only four conservatives in the building, I think, other than Ann. And Ann was making a case for illegal immigration against illegal immigration. And she was laying out, as she does, and as you do, and as almost every liberal or every conservative on, on in media does, she was laying out a fact-based argument. You know, this is what it does to the crime rates. This is what it does to the unemployment rates. This is how many millions it cost me. And at the end of the debate, at the end of the comment, Bill Bill Maher looked at her and said, "Yeah, but you're a slut." And everybody in everybody in the building laughed and thought it was funny. And my point Unbelievable. being, but that's who he is. But but the fact of the matter was that's exactly how this all plays out. She lays out this argument based on fact and data and actual history, and then he calls her name, and nothing gets resolved. But he moves to the next point, and that's kind of right. what I, this is. We're watching this happen in the media. You know, now we've got this Michael Cohen tape where apparently. Donald Trump said please to somebody when he asked him for a Coke. And that is uh, at the uh, that's the next end of the world story. Right. The next end of the world story that ultimately is going to help Trump in the end. Here's the thing about the ad hominem attack. They've done it for so long. It's been so vitriolic. There's no corner that they haven't gone into in terms of uh, coming up with things that they can call us. You know, if you called an Uncle Tom, a coon, it just loses its meaning. It, it, it does, it's not effective anymore. You know, it's, it's like the boy who cried wolf. Oh, my gosh, the world is ending every single day. You know, I've survived at least 1,314 Armageddon, um, uh, leftist Armageddon, and it, it doesn't feel real anymore. So they're, they're going to keep doing that. They're going to keep being outraged. And this is why people are losing faith in them. This is why people are switching uh, to the side of the troops. This is why people are coming more center, more moderate, uh, more right. Um, and it's, it's literally their own fault. It's their own doing. So I encourage them to keep going with the dishonesty. I encourage them to keep going with the lies. I encourage them to keep calling people like Ann Coulter a slut, because at the end of the day, that helps our cause. There's actually a really good story, not a good story, but a sad story. But it, but a, uh, another example today, Robert Krejcik on, on Breitbart.com did a story about there was a kosher deli being opened up in L.A. yesterday by a, uh, a Jewish owner. And the L.A. protesters were outside harassing him for being a racist. And and I'm thinking to myself, do they not? It it feels to me like there is absolutely zero self-awareness from anybody on the left. And or or, 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 they can't all be that stupid. They just can't. I think they might be. (laughs) I think they might be. I mean, from what I'm observing, you have to understand, especially me and and Turning Point USA, and we hit these college campuses, I get white girls coming up to me telling me I'm a white supremacist. I mean, they're just deluded. They're, they're either stupid or they're deluded. I like to think that they're both because to, to be that, you know, unself-aware, right, to be that unaware of yourself when you're speaking to a black woman and saying that they're preaching white supremacy, it's, it's like sometimes I'm on a different planet. You know, I'm like, is this a different planet? Is there gravity here? I don't know where they're living. But like I said, I think I'm starting to think it's, a lot of it's very funny. Life is comedy. And I'm super optimistic about the results of their actions. I think it all culminates itself in, in one argument about the border. I mean, the left honestly believes that if we eliminate ICE and open our borders, the world will be a better place. They just refuse to pay attention to the terrorist activity that is increasing on a daily basis around the world because we're quelching ISIS and all of their friends. And so they're having to reach out independently around the globe as opposed to making concerted efforts in the Middle East. Even though that job's not done, the fact of the matter is they've told us they're going to come to our country, they're going to infiltrate the Syrian refugee crisis and the migrant crisis, and they're going to kill people that aren't followers of Allah. I mean, they, they, and then the left is at the border lying about policy. It's, you know, Obama era policies that have come into the Trump era. He's tried to, you know, he's basically eliminated Obama's legacy inside of two years, which is a great thing, except for Obamacare. But we're watching this argument play out the border in a way that just isn't rational. I mean, on what planet does eliminating a law enforcement agency sent to protect your citizens make us safer? Only in a liberal world uh, could that be said. 
Right, exactly. I'm Planet Democrat. And look, this isn't the first one of our agencies that serves to protect the American people that they've gone after. You know, they prior to and all of the election 2016, they were going after police officers, right? They're, and now they're going after ICE agents and, and they are disrespecting our troops uh, that defend us every single day. So this is sort of their thing, and they're playing a dangerous numbers game, right? Like, I mean, that's why I always think about you're going to attack entire agencies now, which means their entire families. This is what grows our movement. Um, so it, it's senseless. I think personally they want anarchy. They want disruption. They want America to fail under Trump so they can simply say four words, I told you so. That's it. It, it, it comes down to virtue signaling. It comes down to anger. It comes down with an inability to accept the fact that they were wrong, that they don't understand something, that they didn't see something that Donald Trump saw. They didn't understand that we were on the brink of losing this country, which, by the way, let me say this. If Hillary Clinton had won, that's exactly what would have happened. We would have been in the same position that Europe is facing right now, a crisis, open borders, migrants fleeing in, losing the fabric of their culture. I always say, you know, a, a blessing. God blessed us and, and completely interrupted what was go, a, an evil and nefarious um, scheme, a globalist scheme that we were ultimately going to lose this country. And, and, and thank, I thank God every day that Donald Trump came down to us for that day. And I'm, I'm with you. And, and the biggest concern for me right now is that God has blessed us in so many different ways. And we are, the amount of abuse that we're putting on that blessing is, is almost unsustainable. Um, it, it feels right. to me, and I try to explain to people, my dad told me, Hey, listen, the day you leave this house as an 18 year old, the word fair no longer exists. Don't expect people to try and treat you fairly. It wasn't a cynical right. way. It was just the real world. Don't people aren't going to be looking out for you or your best interests. You need to look out for yourself, take care of yourself and be accountable for the things that you do and say, because the world's not going to. And liberals right. seem to live in a world where none of those things apply. Everything that happens is someone else's fault. Everything that, that is right right is 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 so anti-american and and right and it's become such a and i never thought in my lifetime we'd be talking about things like you know elimination of due process for search and seizure of firearms in the united socialism, states socialism uh, right yeah, a la- socialism yeah, a, in America. And that's exactly what it is candace the, yeah. the left continues to put out uh, uh, examples of of the the opposite i mean you look at Antifa is the best example I've ever seen of, of the left. Antifa is a group of people acting exactly like the brown shirts did in 1930, who right. were fascists, by the way, and they're calling they're themselves anti-fascist. I mean, yeah, on, they're, they're, on no planet stupidity. does that happen anywhere else. But, but you see what the problem is, is that they're, they're extremely uneducated. They don't understand what fascism is. They, they don't understand basic definitions. They don't understand world history. They don't understand geography. They, I, they couldn't point out all 50 states on a map. You heard uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She simply said, almost like she was a robot repeating something, that the Israelis were occupying Palestine. I mean, that's incomprehensibly stupid. It really is actually incomprehensibly stupid. I can't even understand that level of stupid. And to think that she's in a position of leadership, right, that people elected her, that's a scary thing. She's talking about socialism. She doesn't understand that Palestine is on a country that's being occupied by Israel. She doesn't understand basic geography. If she did, she might be unstable to, to point to all the countries that have tried socialism and understand that it failed and that socialism has killed 100 million people in the last 100 years and that putting a democratic in front of it doesn't make anything different. <laughs> Democratically electing a socialist like Hugo Chavez isn't really working so well for Venezuela. But she doesn't know. How could she possibly know? If she doesn't even know what is and is not a country, how could she possibly understand the effects of socialism? Much of the same, I think, intelligence goes behind uh, putting Margaret Sanger up on a pedestal as, a, as, a, as an icon. Mm. You know, a woman who, who uh, her, her that. ideas were the foundation for the, uh, the, the final solution for the Third Reich. I mean, when you look at, 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 at some of this stuff, and by the way, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has a degree in foreign relations of all things, from BU. Which and, is- you know why? And this, it's not her fault. So when you point to what the issue is, they're learning this in school. You just brought up earlier uh, the, the myth of the Southern strategy, the idea that Democrats and Republicans switched in the 1970s under some strategy that was employed by, by, by President Nixon, right? They learned that in school. We learned that in school. So that's what it is. It's an uphill battle because they're learning history wrong. wrong. Democrats have been in power for so long and they've effectively rewritten history. So you're sending your children to school to be indoctrinated. That's what we're dealing with. It's an uphill battle when you understand, when you talk about World War II history, how Hitler was able to do it. This is how he, he controlled the information 
that the Germans were receiving controlled the newspapers, the media. We are actually facing that, and they think that they're fighting it when they're actually a part of it. It's, it's incredibly ironic and quite scary when you think that our media has successfully brainwashed so many people into believing that they're fighting Hitler, that, you know, they think Trump is literally Hitler. They always use that comparison. But in fact, they are the closest thing to the Nazis. They don't understand the roots of all Nazism. As you brought up Margaret Sanger, I was horrified in D.C. this past week, and I went to a museum, and they were honoring Margaret Sanger, talking about how amazing she was. Nobody knows the history of eugenics and what she tried to do, that she exclusively, you know, wanted to get rid of races that were less than during the progressive era. That was a sentiment in America. Uh, and, and that Hitler did. He found, um, what, was, what was that novel that was like number one, the, the, the great, the passing of the great race, that, that, that really was the basis of everything and, and, the, and the, ideology, the, the ideology that fell from that was all about cleansing and purifying the race. They're honoring the people that started that. <laughs> and they have no idea. Yeah, well, it, it's amazing to me that, that well, and, and it, you're right. You said something I, I really haven't thought. It's not really her fault. It, it's, it's, it's our fault. Our, we've allowed our education system to be infiltrated by, uh, you know, the grandchildren of Saul Alinsky. Uh, and, and the things that they're teaching and the things that they're doing are so against everything this country was founded on. And, and I, I, I like to use a, uh, a picture. There was a picture a couple of years back of, of ISIS and some terrorist groups around the Middle East tearing down Christian uh, monuments. And I posted a picture of that next to a po- picture of liberals in America tearing down a statue in the South. And I said, listen, right. you know, the, the statue was not put up there to celebrate slavery. The statue was put up there to recognize a very different period of history, a dark period of history in our country's time. And the fact of the matter is that has to be remembered forever because we don't ever want to repeat that. Now you have students at Harvard, black students at Harvard, asking for a segregated graduation ceremony. You have students in Michigan asking for segregated dorms. And it, it, the left is really backpedaling and, and, and going backwards in ways I never thought possible. Right. It, it's completely regressive. I was, I was absolutely horrified to, to see this uh, all-black graduation. Just imagine, this is, this is supposed to be the, the smartest group of students in this country should be attending Harvard University, right? I mean, the smartest group of individuals, the smartest Black people in this country, uh, students are attending Harvard University, and this is what they came up with. I read the article, they said they had worked on this for years. Just imagine what's going on. And this is why I joined Turning Point USA, because that vertical, education is how we got here. Us not paying attention, teachers, parents having faith that when they send their students to school, when they send their uh, children to school, that they're coming to learn something, that they're going to learn something after being indoctrinated. You didn't think it was plausible that your children were actually not learning the truth, that your children were being persuaded against uh, the fabric of America, right? And this seeps in. This is something that Dr. Jordan Peterson talks a lot about, how cultural Marxism seeped into our universities via Yale in the 1970s. And, and it's a problem, you know, and it's, it's a problem that I wasn't optimistic about. And, and when you see it up close in person, we could talk about it all day. But until you're on the ground, you see what happens when Charlie Kirk and I sit in a chair with a sign behind us that says, I believe in free markets. Until you see how vitriolic, how hateful, how terrifyingly angry these students are because we believe in free markets and capitalism, uh, that is the only moment you will understand um, how important it is that we attack that vertical of education, that we get our schools and our universities back. I'll close with these two points. These parents, same parents are paying a quarter million dollars for the privilege of having their kids indoctrinated. And it's it's what? it's mind boggling. It's it's just mind numbing uh, and, and amazing. Hey, Candace, listen, I can't thank you enough. I would love to have you back. And uh, if you ever need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much for having me. Breitbart News Daily with Alex Marlow. Censorship is a key issue here, particularly for people on the right. Do you think it was addressed adequately? Definitely not. It was useful to name check Diamond and Silk. It was useful to check even politicians who had campaign ads that were shut down. But in every case, Zuckerberg was allowed to essentially dismiss the case and move on. Breitbart News Daily, weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern on Sirius XM Patriot 125. We want to hear from you. Tweet the show at Garrick38. Once again, here's Kurt Schilling. We're going to close the show. Our second guest today, our uh, cleanup hitter, former White House Press Secretary, and a man who, uh, who, if he was at work today, would be 
uh, I, well, I feel sorry for Sarah Huckabee Sanders because the GDP went up 4.1% today, and the left is going to create another world-ending scenario somehow out of that. He is uh, uh, the author of The Briefing, Politics, the Press, and the President, which you can find at Amazon.com and everywhere new books are sold. He is the one and only Sean Spicer. Good morning, Sean. How are you, buddy? I'm great, Kurt. Thanks for having me on. Hey, uh, we were talking about your book. It's number three on Amazon. But have you taken a look at the category that it's under? Uh, I, th- well, it's it's under all books, but yeah, there's different sections that it gets ranked. So yeah, apparently it got filed under Russia and <laughs> Trump. Well, no, what it what it is is they have all of these subcategories for bestsellers, <laughs> and and I, you know so that you could baseball or pitching, and so every right. position and every category, Russia and England, and so yeah, it's but it's 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 doing well in a bunch of different ones, but yeah, that's. I- it's I, I want to ask you, uh, my favorite series ever on in the history of television is The West Wing. And yep. one of the reasons I loved it was because it kind of gave me, I always like to look behind the scenes at, at really uh, uh, people who are the best in the world at what they do and, and what their jobs are like. And I was wondering if you could kind of take me through. So, so as a press secretary, I would imagine your work day is about 25 hours a day. Um, there is no downtime. And every single time you, quote unquote, go to work, you're facing uh, an adversary uh, on a daily basis. And nothing I don't think anybody in our lifetimes has ever had to deal with the things you've had to deal with and had to deal with. And that Sarah Huckabee Sanders does as well. But take me through a day. I mean, you, you show up at the, what time do you arrive at the White House? And I know that that varies but normally. Yeah, I, and I think it, it, I, like you, I actually love the West Wing, and, and part of the reason I wrote the book was to be able to give people behind the scenes of like, what is it like, and what's the day like, and you know, paint them a picture of these meetings. And I do, I walk through exactly what you're talking about. I used to get up at 5 a.m., try to get into the White House by about 5:30, 5:40, and then I joke about this in the book that I'd say it's an insult to working out. But I would, they had this little, you know, small little gym, like a hotel gym, across uh, in the old executive office building for senior staff. And I would go in there and just sort of get on the elliptical, have a couple iPhones, two iPhones going, and try to be scanning through Twitter and news and transcripts and then have the TV overhead on to hear what cable news was talking about. I'd get done um, and in my office, all showered up, ready to go by about 7, and then just start meeting with my staff about what was coming up, what events we were pushing out, where we were going to be on defense. We'd have a senior staff meeting around 8 where the different you know heads of the different components of the White House would talk about what's going on. And then we would internally in the press office start getting ready every day for the briefing. And so you basically are spending three hours cramming for a final exam every day. And, you, you know, it's, it's your staff, it's other staff, like subject matter experts, they'd come in. And then you'd do the briefing. And after the briefing, you would literally, then it would be sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, like cleanup. You'd figure, okay, what, what, met, what reporters didn't get a question that need to get one, who needed to get followed up on, what information did you see, get back to people on, and, it, you know, could you find, could you, for, you know, get back to them on something, you had to go figure it out. Um, and then there was, like, meetings and, and reporter inquiries yeah, all throughout the afternoon. At about 6, 7 o'clock, we'd have what we call a wrap-up meeting. The team would gather, kind of say, hey, here's what we're dealing with, like, all of the press secret- all of the assistant press secretaries and the deputies have issue areas, and they would tell you, this is what's going on in my issue, this is where we are with this reporter, da 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 And then you would kind of spend between, say, 7 and 10 o'clock at night preparing for the next day or, you know, further getting back to people, go home and, you know, repeat the next day. And the thing that was so fascinating about the job or, or you know, or intense about it was there's no off. You know, you, if, if something happens domestically or internationally, at three in the morning, you're up at three in the morning taking that call. And it's, it was sort of, that's what I think was the most, you know, one of the most challenging parts of the job is there's no off. It's not, you don't get a down day to say, okay, today I'm just not going to be on. If something happens, they need to be able to find you, call you and, you know, make sure that you're, you're talking about the media strategy. And it's four years with no vacation. Let's be very clear about that. There, there, you know, I've said, I've said before, I don't think people understand. And, and I, I said it when Bush was president. I said it when Obama was president. I've always said it. The whole golf course thing and the vacation thing, quote unquote, is so overblown because at no point in time is the president ever off the clock. And, and, and you know, that's why you tr- I would assume your staff travels with him, his staff and all the things go. I mean, he's literally on the clock 24 seven. And, it, you know, it, it, the thing that, that really I, I, I liken it to, I'm a, I'm a huge uh, uh, preparation guy, and I, I, I appreciate and love watching Bill Belichick get his football team ready every week 
and it, I, I liken that to what you did, but you did that in a 24 hour cycle. You had to digest and sift through, you know, millions of gigabytes of information and then stand in front of people who wanted you so badly to make a mistake uh, and were trying to trip you up. And you had to, here's where I had, here's where I wanted to, to ask you. You have to go out and be the voice of the president. You have to be the, the, the opinion and attitude of the president. And you have to speak for the president and, and the administration. How do you do that without making more mistakes, I guess is the question I'd ask. Because, you know, every time you answer a question, I always look at it like a sports agent. Every time an agent opens his mouth, everybody hears the player speaking. Every time you That's say right. something, it's, it's, it's a presidential quote, so to speak. And not only do you have to watch and, 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 and protect that, but you also have to be truthful and upfront and as honest to the, to, as you, our national security clearance allows you to be to a room full of people who don't like you. And, and that's exactly – and there are days when you may know something that would refute a story, and you can't do it because of exactly that, because you're, you're read into a classified situation that – by admitting that it didn't happen, you're admitting that you knew it, it exists. I mean, like, and, and that's what really the mental gymnastics that you go through on that podium every day because you are given a, a ton of information um, on, the, on the classified side because you need to be aware of what's happening so that you don't intentionally walk into something. Um, but on the same time, it, you are then constantly trying to make sure that you don't ever divulge anything that uh, that is that is at that level. And so you're constantly – trying to figure out when I answer a question, am I doing so uh, that's providing the most you know, upfront uh, and honest information on the unclassified level possible? But in some cases, people will say, I can't believe you want to answer that question. And the problem is that you can't answer it because by the very nature of it, it would reveal uh, that you were privy to information in some sort or sources and methods that would, would not be appropriate. It's it is, and you're absolutely right. You're constantly you're speaking for somebody else, and so there are days when someone says, you know, why would you do? Why is this happening? You say, well, so and so believes the following. Well, that's their that's that's what they believe, and the problem is that a lot of reporters don't agree with that belief or that value, and therefore don't like the answer. Let me just say, I, I, I mean, I'm curious about this dynamic. Many times, the seasoned White House press corps ask a question that they know you can't answer. And they and when you don't answer that with the answer they knew you were going to give them, they immediately go down. Uh, uh, and and listen, uh, I, I, he's a complete clown. But Jim Acosta is a great example of a guy who, who who I think is is one of the reasons why the mainstream media has actually committed suicide in the sense that he's turned the press room into an audition for for publicity. Uh, and many of them have. And and they're not asking questions that me, Kurt Schilling, the, the American citizen cares about. They're asking questions because they want to create a story on CNN around something that really isn't a story. I'll give you the best example of that, though. The other day, Acosta posts a photo on the Twitter where he's, you know, some 50 feet uh, and, and the, the press was behind a crowd, uh, you know, a seated crowd that was in, with and the president was out speaking. Acosta, apparently, at the end of the event starts yelling well to the point where everyone in the front said that there's no way anyone could have heard that he was even you know yelling that in terms of the distance he posts a photo saying i tried to ask the president questions but he refused to answer even other reporters said that that was ridiculous because you know so he's trying to create that moment that you're talking about and it's it literally is because they want to promote this fake narrative and because he is as you put it a clown that is more interested in looking like he's creating an image of, of pursuing the truth when, in fact, all he's doing is, is, I think, undermining good journalism. When I look at the, the Don Lemons and the Jake Tappers and the Rachel Maddows and the, uh, all of the, the Matthews of the world, they, they've, they've ruined, and, and, and I think for better in, in the end, they've ruined the influence that the mainstream media has on, on rational thinking American citizens. And I don't think that's a bad thing. And I, I point out things like this, and I... I it, it, the hypocrisy, I, I hate to use the word hypocrisy because I think it does so little to, to really tell the story. But the fact of the matter is the Trump administration, uh, and I know exactly how this happened. They called this woman into the office and said, you know what? What you just did was ridiculous and embarrassing. You're not going to be allowed to go to the South Lawn event. You know, anybody from your station can cover it, but you're not allowed to. She said, oh, I don't care. I wasn't going anyway. Then they report this major story of her being kicked out. And the left goes berserk at this, and for some dumbass reason fox news decides to stick with cnn 
Although this happened more than once during the Obama administration and nobody cared. Well, and, and here's, the, here's the issue. I'm, I am, and I think you are, a big advocate of like a free and open press. But the thing that I find fa- fascinating, and we started to talk about it with Acosta, is that we've, they, they equate access and freedom with lack of, profe- you know, profe- lack of professionalism and lack of decorum and lack of respect. The idea that Acosta the other day, when he was sitting in that – uh, overseas, and he just starts yelling at the president and demanding a question right off the bat, and then expects everyone to apologize because the president called on somebody else. Just because you stand up and start yelling at the president doesn't entitle you to a question. I mean, this is th- we have literally lost all sense of decorum. When, the, when a conservative did this uh, to President Obama in the Rose Garden, got up and started yelling, which I think was inappropriate then, then uh, and now it's become kind of the cool thing to do among the press corps, and it undermines their entire credibility throughout. It adds to the notion that this is no longer about the news. It's about the news people. There's no doubt in my mind, every person that's, in my opinion, committed crimes of potential treason and, and felonies in the Obama administration is now a special advisor to CNN, if that doesn't tell you what's, you know, where the, the incentive <laughs> lies in being a, a, an idiot. I got to tell you, though, it's a job. I look at it. I would love to do it. I would I would get fired after the first day because I, I there's I, I, I would look at it. Jim Acosta and say, you know what, just shut the hell up and let's get somebody to ask a question that actually matters. And, and I can imagine there are times and, and, and get watching you and, and kind of getting a feel for your personality. I can't imagine how many times you were sitting up there thinking, you know what, are you that stupid? Uh, and not being able to say that kind of sucks. Uh, but well, but, and, but, and the other thing is, and the other thing, Kurt, is that you, you, in some of these cases, you, it was so duplicitous and hypocris- hypocritical in the sense that they would come in in the morning, and be like, "Hey, buddy, what's going on?" Or, "Hey, I'm sorry that I had to ask that question." The briefing, and I'm like, "I don't really care. You can ask anything you want, but don't try to come in and pretend that we're buddies or that you know that you're somehow upset about it. That's who you are." And the level of, you know, duplicity was amazing. That's my other problem is being in a room full of people that I don't like, I would have a really hard time hiding that because, and it's not, I don't say that to be funny, but the fact of the matter is if I don't have respect for you, it's very hard for me to deal with you rationally. And the things that they, I mean, they come in and they'll ask questions uh, about a policy and, and, you know, the world's going to end tomorrow, the boy who cried wolf. And then they'll go on the air and they'll say something that has nothing to do with anything they just did, but they'll create a, 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 a world is going to end kind of story, which they've been doing day in and day out. I mean, like I said, the GDP is up 4.1% today. So the left is going to find another porn star who somehow was so- associated with the third cousin of a Trump friend, and they'll come up with, you know, uh, some sort of phone call. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. No, you're right. You're right. I mean, how many questions today? And here's the thing. Or it's going to be looked at in a negative way. Don't you think your policies will now? I mean, no matter. Think about this. Everything that he's done, no matter what, what indice you look at, and when it gets stronger, then the question becomes, well, don't you think it's going to go down now because your policies? It's like the same policies that got us here. Somehow now they're questioning whether or not they'll continue the same growth that they were questioning at the outset. Hey, let me ask you a question I think I've wanted to know since day one, and I think a lot of people would really like to know. You've been in D.C. You were, you, 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 I, I think you had a very good perspective on, on politics and politicians in the world the way the Beltway ran. Now you have Donald Trump coming into the mix, and he is the ultimate you know, fly in the ointment from a D.C. politician's perspective. We asked for someone that wasn't a politician, and that's exactly what we got. How different was it? To, you know, because I'm sure that there was a learning curve for you to get him up to speed and for him to get to know you. How different was it dealing with him on a daily basis when everything first started as opposed to, you know, hey, Mr. President, you actually can't say that. And Mr. President, I actually can't say that. And, and he, I, I can imagine he's thinking, well, why can't I say that? Because that's the truth. And why can't I tweet that? I mean, what was that dynamic like when you first kind of sat down and said, OK, I'm your press secretary. Tell me what you want me to do. Oh, God, you're right. And it's, I think it still happens in some respects because he doesn't care about how it's supposed to work and what the tradition has always been. He's results oriented and you're, he didn't come here to, you know, um, to curry favor with the Washington establishment. You know, he's 72 years old. He's worth billions of dollars and he's done a ton. I mean, he did it because he actually wants to change things for the better. And you can disagree with that. You can, you know, agree or disagree. But the fact of the matter is, is a guy with a billion dollars. Uh, or billions of dollars that's done all this stuff at 72 years old doesn't need to go out and you know as you were we were talking about a moment ago live a 24 7 lifestyle where you got to be on the clock um, but he believes in, in helping the country 
So, you know, it was uh, the first couple weeks, if not the first few months. I mean, it was it was it was a whirlwind because you're right. He wasn't worried about how it used to work. He would said, this is, you know, this is how I want to do it. This is how we're going to make this happen. And he still does it today. You saw him. I mean, he'll call people up out of the, you know, an audience who's there at the BFW the other day. He called calls this guy up, but I'm sure the Secret Service was having a heart attack. Um, but he's sort of, his view is, you know what, I want to, you know, welcome this individual or I want to, you know, have this event, whatever it is, he just does it. He's genuine, and that's the thing that people don't, you can like him, dislike him, disagree with him, or whatever you want to do. He's genuine, and the and, and the thing that, uh, uh, you know, I I, I got to tell you, I, one of the things that I laugh about is, as, as a lover of this administration and everything it's done, I, I wish his Twitter habits were a little bit better and different, but I got to imagine that you're like you're still alive today because of Twitter. Because if if he didn't have Twitter available to him, then that means he would have had to use you at all hours of the day to get messages out. He didn't want to hold in. Well, not only that, but but all I am is a vehicle to the media, right? So the thing that's so amazing about Twitter is like it, not like it. There's no question about what he thinks on a whole host of things at a whole host of times. And he doesn't need the media to um, to interpret for him, which is what they do so often. They'll go out and say what he meant and what he said was, you can literally now in 240 characters read exactly what he wants to say or think. The beauty of this is I never, ever have to question what is on the president's mind. And that's never, ever been been possible in, in, in my lifetime anyway. Listen, I'm going to close up with one thing. I'm going to ask you a favor, and I know it's inappropriate given we just met. But uh, I have a feeling that you know Sarah Huckabee Sanders decently yes. well. And I would love to interview this woman and talk to her. I'm a huge fan. She knows I'm a fan. But I would love to have her on. I know I, you know, it wouldn't be an ambush or anything like that. I just want to get a chance to catch oh, yeah. her. I'd be glad to. I'd be glad to do it. I was with Sarah last night. We had a big book party in uh, in uh, in DC. She was there, and uh, I'd be glad to follow up with her. I think yep, I know. She, I know you guys have to go and, through and, we, and stuff to do things. But yeah, I would love to have her on. Yeah. So, well, the other thing is, they, those folks from Arkansas need to get a little Red Sox nations in them, and they they need to understand what it's like <laughs> to be in first place. The book is called The Briefing, Politics, the Press, and the President. You guys, it is it is a must-read. You can find it on Amazon.com, anywhere good American-loving books are sold. Sean, I can't thank you enough. Love to have you back, pal. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I had as much fun today as I've had in, uh, since I started doing this show. And if Sean holds true, which I absolutely believe he will, I'm going to get Sarah Huckabee Sanders on here, and we're going to have a ton of fun as we move forward. This has been a great week. To my producer, Vince, who continues to... Just kick ass and take names and as he lines up this uh, the, the guest day after day. Hopefully this show is is uh, doing everything I hoped it would do for you, which is just keep you informed day to day on the things that affect your life and my life on a daily basis. So to, to Sean and to Candace, thank you. God bless you guys. Thank you for tuning in. And I'll catch you guys again next week. Unless you fall in line with their liberal agenda, this uniparty globalist liberal agenda, they will never support you. They, they, they use the whole gender issue, of course, as some kind of tool to prop up their, their messaging, but it's the phoniest thing. Sirius XM Patriot Channel 125.